beautiful, beautiful strange with which to begin our service. We welcome you in Jesus' name. We're so glad that you're here tonight and trust that you've had a wonderful day in the Lord and have been greatly encouraged in him. Uh, understood we had a great sermon this morning um, by uh, Andrew Hain, and I appreciate my brother and his ministrations with us. I, of course, was with Monte Calvario and I uh, had a wonderful uh, morning with them. But uh, I hope this has been a great day for you. I want to remind you of just a few things that are going on in the life of the church. The youth group, we think they should be back or close to being back anyway from Myrtle Beach. And uh, having had a, a good time, Bill Pierce texted me early this morning and said that things were going very well. So we're greatly uh, encouraged about that. Reminds me. Uh, to remind you to pray for the middle school retreat coming up in February, in four weeks or so from now. And I want to pray for that uh, ongoing work. Um, thank you all so much for praying for my mom. Uh, she continues in her present state. And uh, uh, just thank you for praying for mercy and grace for her. She's 99, and um, uh, they are, are telling us that things are coming to the end, I guess, um, but she continues to uh, to hang in there at that point. And again, I so appreciate your your prayers. Please continue to pray for uh, Nancy Harrison and family with the passing of Lewis. And of course, we had his funeral uh, this past week, and want to pray for their uh, encouragement and strength. Um, also, want you to pray for Leah White. And Leah was hospitalized last night, I believe. Uh, with a heart issue this morning when I talked to her they were not exactly sure what that heart issue was she anticipates seeing her cardiologist um, sometime this week uh, but we do want to pray for her and her strength and then Ray Fowler called me early this morning and asked that we pray for him as he was having some GI issues um, for which he was hospitalized uh, as well so I want to remember Ray um, also well, with those announcements made, let me ask you to take your Bible and join me at Psalm 34. Psalm 34. I want to read the first 10 verses of this psalm um, as a call to worship, and I hope just as, a, uh, as an encouragement to your heart uh, to be reminded of the goodness of God and his faithfulness to meet our needs on an everyday basis. Here God calls us to worship himself at Psalm 34 and verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your character. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for revealing that character to us, that we would be reminded that you never leave us nor forsake us, that your grace is all sufficient that you give us every good thing, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. And we praise you for your goodness. We do look to you and we are made radiant. Our faces are not ashamed. Father, we pray that we would rehearse not only your attributes, your character, but your gracious acts towards man. Father, we ask that tonight as we sing and read the scriptures and preach and pray that you would give us grace, that we would present to you that which would be pleasing in your sight. We ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 
Let's stand and worship the Lord together with hymn number 72, Trust and Obey. Join me as we go before the throne of grace and lift our prayers of petition and intercession. Let's pray together. Father, I'm reminded of Psalm 56 and verse 3. When I am afraid, then I will trust in you. And we think of this verse, we think of King David when he says this, that this is King David, first of all. The one who slew Goliath, slew the lion, the one who would lead the forces of your people for so many years, but he confessed to, at times, being afraid. And then, in that very moment, in the moment of, of being afraid, to which he readily admitted, he trusted in you. He set his heart upon you, to rest in you, to, to say, Lord, you've got to handle this. And, Lord, we do the same thing. We come to you. There are times when we are afraid and we, we ask for that grace to be able to say, Lord, you've, you have this. You must have this because we don't. And your promises are yes and amen. You can be trusted. You are who you say you are. You are faithful. You've never let us down. And so we come tonight and say when we are afraid, we will trust in you. Thank you for that. Father, we uh, think of those in our midst who are uh, suffering. They're in great need. And we would ask that you would move on their behalf. We think of Ray Fowler. We think of Leah White. We pray that you touch them physically. Bring about strength and encouragement. We pray as well for uh, the Harrisons, for Nancy, for Holly, for Kathy, for those extended families, for Mary Jo and Wendell, and ask that you would encourage those folks in uh, this face of this loss. We ask, Father, that your blessing would be upon our youth ministry and those that are traveling back from Myrtle Beach and pray that 
that this would not have just been a weekend of uh, fun, but would be a weekend of learning where our folks are steeled against the forces of this world and the flesh and made stronger, their faith strengthened. We ask, Father, that you would bless us as families, that you would help us as parents and grandparents to be pouring into the lives of our children. And, Lord, that you would stir our children and cause them to be those receptive to the truth. Lord, help us not to provoke our children to wrath and help our children to honor our father and our mother that their days may be long upon the earth as well. And Father, we pray for this coming week. We uh, think of this world and the needs that are around us of our neighbors and our co-workers, and our friends, our family, and how they need to hear the gospel. We pray that the gospel would go forth in power. We pray for those opportunities. And uh, Lord, that we would speak the truth and we speak the truth in love and that we would see people um, saved. May we share the gospel even the course of this week. May that be something that is a part of the very uh, fabric of our life that we are concerned and constantly concerned about the lost around us. Father, we pray that you would sanctify Mount Calvary. We pray that you would make us more like Jesus every day and that we might give ourselves to the means of grace, that we might give ourselves to the word and to prayer and to the sacraments, that we would be strengthened uh, on every hand and each day as we walk with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing together nothing but the blood. Why that's no. 
Ben Smarzinski, our seminary intern, to preach for us again tonight. Y'all pray for Ben. He's dealing with this toe pain issue. Come on, brother, and preach to us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me turn this off. Tonight we're going to be in James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And... Uh, our text is going to be in James chapter 2, but, but I'm going to start in, in James chapter 1, and I'll explain why that is a little bit later. So we're going we're gonna to start in James chapter 1 and verse uh, 26, and we're going to read down to chapter 2 and verse 13. James 1 starting in chapter, uh, excuse me, James 1 starting in verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into, if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us here this evening. We thank you for the hymns that we sang already. We thank you for this message. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, sanctify my tongue this evening, that I would only speak the words that you would have me to speak, that I would only speak truth from your word, and that everyone listening tonight would uh, receive a, a blessing from this, would receive a, a spiritual principle that they can carry into their lives in the church and in their private lives as well. I ask you all these things in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I've said this before in our study of the book of James, but I'm, I'm going to say it again tonight, and I'm sure I'll say it many more times uh, before we conclude this study, but the, the book of James is an essential unity. And oftentimes, because of the uh, uh, chapter headings that we have in our English translations and in our, in our modern translations, uh, as well as the, the little section headings that you have depending on what uh, system of, of Bible organization you're using. For example, I have the, the Thomas Nelson Bible. Uh, often, the, these different uh, sort of segmentations can lead us to believe that this book is, is a bunch of sort of unconnected thoughts. It's a bunch of, of little sections of wisdom that have no relation to each other. And sometimes the, the uh, logical bridge between thoughts is so subtle that, that it is easy to miss, but I assure you that it is there. And this is the reason that we started in chapter 1 instead of starting in chapter 2. If you remember from the last time that I was before you, we talked about uh, pure religion and how a pure religion is showing mercy to the 
orphans and the widows, visiting them in their trouble. And we, we talked about how that practically means visiting those who are the poorest of the poor in society, visiting those who have no means to take care of themselves, and visiting them in their, their trouble, which means visiting them in, in the time, the, their hardest times of, of difficulty, visiting them when, when money is, is most tight, when, when things are most difficult. And then we jump over to, to chapter 2, and in chapter 2, James uh, connects the, the thought that he had in chapter 1 with, with this bridge of logic, which is, which is uh, he speaks about treating the poor uh, without partiality and with, with respect. So chapter 1, he, he talks about uh, you must show mercy to, to the widows and orphans, and along those lines, along lines of, of showing mercy to the poorest, you must not show partiality uh, against the poor. You must not uh, prefer the rich to the detriment of the poor. And so that's the bridge of logic that connects uh, chapter, chapter 1 to chapter 2. If, if pure, pure religion is, is helping the widows and the orphans, then we should not show partiality in the church. And, and before we move on, let me define exactly what I mean by partiality, because I've said that word a few times, and I'm going to say it a bunch more tonight. Partiality is judging based on external appearance. Judging somebody based on what kind of clothes they wear, how they carry themselves, maybe, uh, the appearance of, of wealth or, or of poverty, instead of judging them based on their character, as reflected in their words and their actions and, and, their, and their deeds. So we're defining partiality as, as making a quick judgment on external factors, such as appearance or, or even wealth, rather than on internal factors, such as purity of character. And so James essentially says here, while we're talking about helping the widows and orphans, you must, you must not show partiality. And you'll notice this very interesting statement as we begin chapter 2. He says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. And he uses this, this interesting sort of uh, uh, extended title for Christ. He says, uh, The Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And I believe there's, there's a reason he's doing this. This is actually very similar to what Paul does in Philippians. If you turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And starting in verse 3, there's a reason that, that he uses this, this sort of special uh, uh, title, the Lord of glory. Philippians 2 and verse 3, and Paul says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And verse 5, Let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. What both Paul and James are doing by, by talking about this, this background of, of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, God the Son, is they're highlighting the fact that, that he was so glorious before his incarnation and, and now after his incarnation. He was so glorious. He, he was crowned in glory, circled by, by the angels, shouting, holy, holy, holy. And yet he came down and, and humbled himself and died the death of the cross. And the point that, that James and, and Paul as well is bringing here is that uh, the, the thing that he's calling to mind is if Christ, who was in, enthroned in glory, more glorious than, than we can even possibly imagine, if this, if this uh, person, the second person of the Trinity, came down and to, to save mankind, to humble himself and, and help mankind, how much more can we who are, who are nothing but sinners saved by grace, how much more can we uh, not show partiality but judge righteous judgment, judge people based on their character, not on their uh, appearance? And so James reminds us of Christ's glory and, and that he himself was humbled, and so we can as well. And this passage this evening, James is going to give us uh, essentially four primary reasons uh, why we should not show partiality. Four arguments against preferring one person over the other based on these external elements. And, and I'll list them for you now. God, first of all, God explicitly forbids partiality. God explicitly forbids partiality. 
Second, God himself does not show partiality. God himself does, does not show partiality. Number three, showing partiality is foolishness. Showing partiality is foolishness. And number four, showing partiality is a breach of the second greatest commandment, which is to love thy neighbor as thyself. So God explicitly forbids partiality. God himself does not show partiality. Showing partiality is foolishness. And showing partiality is a breach of the second greatest commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself. I'm going to move this microphone because it keeps making noise. Uh, so first of all, God specifically forbids partiality. After, after James uh, tells us that, that, that we should not uh, be partial, he gives us this example, this specific story, if you will. He says in verse 2, If there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should come also uh, in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. So James gives this very specific example of favoritism. And favoritism and, and the, the seat placement is, is perhaps the, the least offensive thing that, that is being implied here. Uh, the, 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 least, the, the, the least sin that, that is being committed here is, is the favoritism. That It could be much worse. Matthew Poole suggests that this may note... Uh, they're disposing church offices to them that were rich or favoring them in their causes rather than the poor. So this could be just as bad as um, g giving the rich the better seats. It could be as bad as, as disposing these offices of the church, elders and, and deacons, to those who are rich based on their wealth alone and not based on qualification. And, and each of these is, is, of course, serious because you are devaluing the, the value of, of, of this, this human life based on whether or not they are rich. And, but, uh, and so this is what uh, James is describing here, this preferential treatment being given to the rich. And before we, we go off the deep end here and, and declare that, well, James is saying we don't need to show respect to anybody, we can just treat everybody the same, and th that we don't need to have respect or anything like that, uh, that there are certain uh, people and situations to whom and in which we are to show respect. And, and it's a, a very biblical principle that, that we are to show respect to those who are in authority over us. Uh, for example, Romans 13, uh, 7 says, Render therefore to all their due. Taxes, excuse me, taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. And so James isn't saying, well, just treat everybody you like. You can spit at the king. You can whatever. He's saying specifically that, that this is going on, that this partial treatment is, is, is treating the rich better than others based on their wealth alone. And if you, if you look at the story, it's clear that the, the church does not recognize these people coming in. There's a rich man and a poor man, and they don't seem to be well known in the church. And, and they're treating this rich man better only because he is rich. Not because they know he's a governor or a king or an authority or anything, but only because he is rich. And this is what James is condemning. And he specifically condemns it in verse 4. He says, uh, Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And, and perhaps you're thinking, well, you said that, that God specifically condemns partiality, but, but here it's just James condemning partiality. So what, so what, what, what do you mean that, that God condemns it? Well, James is actually calling to mind a, a passage in Leviticus. If you just turn quickly to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. And many of the early church were, were Jews, and so I'm sure that some of them would have known this passage. Leviticus 19. It's very similar to what James says in James 2. Leviticus 19 and verse 15. He says, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. So we see here in Leviticus, and we see that James is calling to mind the, the, the passage in Leviticus where, where partiality is specifically condemned by God, where God specifically says, this is something that you shall not do. And again, I'd, I'd like to step back and say there are situations in which we do have to be discerning. Uh, I, for example, if, if we are giving offices in the church, if, if somebody is poor and, and we look at their character and they're poor specifically because they have used their, their money uh, irresponsibly, 
and we say, well, we don't, perhaps this person shouldn't serve because they're obviously irresponsible. That, that's not showing partiality. That, that's showing discernment. What James is talking about here is, is somebody who uh, is, 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 is a situation where maybe two people come uh, uh, as nominees for, for eldership. One is poor, one is rich. Both are, are responsible men. Both uh, use the things that they have in a responsible way. And yet the church grants the, the, the office to the rich man only because he is rich. They do not consider the poor man only because he is poor. And this is what God condemns, and this is what James is describing. So God specifically condemns partiality. Number two, uh, God does not himself show partiality. And and this argument is found in in verse 5. James says in in James 2, verse 5, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? And I'd like you to, to flip to one more place of 1 Corinthians in chapter number 1. And this is very similar, again, to, to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians in, in chapter number 1. And I'll just start reading for, for time's sake. 1 Corinthians 1, in verse, starting in verse 26. For your, you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of this world, and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So what both, again, what both Paul and James are saying is that God often, in his dealings with humanity, uses the least likely people to bring about his redemptive plans in history. We look uh, at the church, the the history of the church. While while God has called all types of men into the church throughout the ages, yet yet historically the poor have been the the most uh, dominant uh, demographic in in the pews. And even even before the the church age, in the the, uh, Old Testament, this is always how God has, has dealt with his people. We think about Abraham, and who was Abraham before God called him? He is uh, described in Joshua, I believe, as, as just another idolater beyond the river. Perhaps, perhaps the, the least of the idolaters, because he, he had no heir, he had no children. And yet God used him in his old age to, to become the father of, of the ethnic uh, children of Israel and, and the spiritual father of, of all who believe, as it says in, in Romans. Who was, who was David before he became king? He was, he was the, the youngest of his father's children as far as we know. He was the youngest of eight brothers. Yet God turned him into the the greatest, the the mightiest warrior in Israel and and the most famous king in Israel in all of of that country's history. So James admonishes us to refrain from showing partiality because this is not how God works. And we are to model our lives after, after how God works. Number three, showing partiality is foolish. Now, now James just goes on to describe uh, the foolishness of showing partiality here in verses 6 and 7. He says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? And certainly it's true that in James' time period, the, the uh, wealthiest often uh, persecuted the, the church the hardest. They were often the ones who were, who were most adamant against the church. If you want an example of this, I believe uh, Acts 19, 19 is a good example. We won't turn there tonight. But in the last half of that chapter, we see the, the, the silversmiths of Ephesus. And they were persecuting the church because um, they, they started a riot because their, their livelihoods were being threatened. Because if, if, they could no longer, if there were no longer any um, idolaters, if there were no longer any people to serve Diana, there would be no uh, trade left. There would be no idols to make, and they would, they would have no money anymore. I think that, that today often the most influential, perhaps some of the wealthiest, especially those in Hollywood, often uh, mock Christianity. They, they uh, try to persecute Christianity, but it's very light compared to what I think James was, was speaking of here. We see James describing them as, as blaspheming the name of God, of, of dragging Christians into the court. I just don't think that we see that on, on the same level as, as, as James did. And yet the, the principle stays the same. The overall point that James is making here, I think, is that wealthy people are are sinners just like the rest of mankind. Wealthy people are are no better 
than the rest of mankind. And often, the wealthiest in society are the most morally degenerate. And in, uh, if you just flip over one page to James chapter 5, he, he describes this situation, and we'll get to this eventually in our study of James, but James chapter 5, in verse 1, he says, Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. And their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sebaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. And so we see James describing the wealthiest as, as those who often uh, commit fraud, those who trust the most in their riches, and therefore the, the ones who will, who will be most upset in the day of judgment, those who will lose the most in the day of judgment. And of course, we know uh, this is not true of, of all wealthy people. There are wealthy people in the Bible. There are wealthy people in the church. But, but as a general rule, it does seem that the, the wealthiest in society tend to be the most morally degenerate. And so what James is arguing is that it's foolish to show to them partiality, to assume that they are better people based on, on their appearance of wealth, when often it is, it is just the opposite. And lastly, showing partiality is a breach of the second greatest commandment, which is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And we see this in verses 8 and 9. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Notice that the, the opposites that, that James brings here. If you fulfill the royal law, you shall love your neighbor. In other words, if, if you don't show partiality, if you love all men the same way, if you treat uh, the poor man and the rich man with respect and with honor, and you do well. But if you commit sin by, show par by showing partiality, then you are convicted of the law by a transgressor. And something uh, that I, that I br uh, breezed upon in this study so far is that uh, th there's this important element in the passage, in this whole passage, that is uh, often showing partiality and showing special favors to the rich is often done in detriment of the poor. John Calvin says that James does not simply disapprove of honor being paid to the rich, but that this should not be done in a way so as to despise or reproach the poor. And often, if you, if you show special respect to somebody just because they're wealthy, especially in the church, you do so to, to the harm, to the hurt, to the offense of those who are poor. And what are we saying when we show this kind of partiality? Are we saying that the, the rich are more valuable than the poor? I think that that could be true. Are we saying, like the, the, the proponents of the prosperity gospel, that God loves the rich more and therefore he has blessed them. I think that that's a possibility. We have to ask ourselves exactly how this kind of showing partiality lines up with the charity we are supposed to pay the, the poor as we saw in chapter 1. How does that line up? How does that work? If we are not respecting the, the poor as well as the rich, is our religion pure or is it defiled? Whatever else we're saying, we are certainly not loving our neighbors without discrimination as Christ commanded us to do and as James points out. And James continues to, to highlight the seriousness of this offense in, in verses 10 and 11. He says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. God has, has given us the law as, as a rule for, for, for uh, faith and practice. He has, he has given us th this, these rules that we are to follow because we love him, because, because he has told us, I don't want you to do these things, I do want you to do these things. And because he has saved us from our sin, because he has done so much for us, we are to follow th this law. We, we are to take it seriously. We are to not uh, allow the fact that we are, we are saved uh, by grace through faith to, to uh, stop our law keeping. We know that we are not saved by following the law, but it's still important because the, the God who saved us has said, this is what I want you to do. And out of gratitude, we should keep that law. But James says that, that if we uh, show partiality, 
we are not loving our neighbors, and therefore we are breaking this entire law. He says we, we break the entire law. We, stump, he, we are guilty of all. What, what does he mean by, by that, that we're guilty of all? Well, he doesn't mean that if you steal something, if you're guilty of theft, you're also guilty of adultery. You're, you're guilty of that specific sin. If you're guilty of one sin, you're, you're guilty of each other specific sin. What he is saying is, if you break one sin, you have, have breached the entire law. Let me give you an example of this to, to make, so that it makes more sense. One of my roommates, uh, his name is Dan, he's a realtor, a real estate agent. And I was talking to him about this this week, and, and he said that what James is talking about is very similar to uh, a real estate deal and, and contracts in real estate. And I'm sure many of you know this already, but, but if there are certain obligations that, that homeowners are required to perform, uh, in, in a real estate transaction, if they fail to perform those obligations, then the contract can be made null. For example, if, 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 a, sell, if a buyer comes and says, all right, I'll, I'll buy this property for you know, this amount of money, but I want you to fix the plumbing, there's, there's a leaky faucet, I want you to fix this, this leaking roof, and I want you to fix this air conditioning. And the homeowner agrees and they move towards closing. And as the date of closing comes around, uh, lo and behold, the, the homeowner has fixed the roof, he has fixed the plumbing, but he hasn't fixed the air conditioning. Now, he's done a lot of good things. He's done a lot of the things according to the contract, but he hasn't, he hasn't fulfilled the whole contract. He still hasn't fixed the air conditioning. And so even though this is a multifaceted uh, uh, contract and the homeowner uh, fulfilled most of the contract, because he, he failed in one point, that contract could be null. The, the buyer could walk away with, with no uh, due diligence fees because that contract has been broken. Even, even though he just f uh, failed in one area, the contract is broken. And that's what James is saying here. That if we fail in, in one area, we have, we have broken the whole law. And, and this should be serious to us. It's certainly serious to James. He's speaking in very emphatic language here. And he goes on in verses 12 and 13 and says, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we are told to behave as those who will be judged by the perfect law of liberty. But why, why does he call it the perfect law of liberty? We saw this in uh, James 1 and verse 25. He says, uh, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, this one will be blessed in what he does. We didn't really talk about what, what exactly James means by the law of liberty. I like the way that Albert Barnes, the commentator, explains this. He says, uh, it's called the law of liberty because it is a law producing freedom from the servitude of sinful passions and lusts. We are Christians, uh, we as Christians are able to do what is right. We have uh, the knowledge through the law written on our heart, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and through the, the written word, we have the knowledge of what the law of God is. And because we have the Holy Spirit, we are able to keep that law. And often we, we do fail, but we are able to keep that law. And so we have the knowledge and the ability to keep the law of God. And so when we break God's law, we do so without any excuse. Because we know what it is, we, we can keep it. When we fail to, to keep the law of God, we do so without excuse. Because, because the, the law has become to us the law of liberty, the law that frees us from our bondage to sin. So James' reasoning goes like this. If you do not, if you show, excuse me, if you show partiality, you are not loving your neighbor. If you are not loving your neighbor, you are breaking the entire law of God. But this breaking God's law is without excuse because to us, again, the commandments of God free us from bondage to sin. So he uses this to, to say that you should live as if uh, on judgment day you'll have no excuse uh, why you did not keep the law of God. Because that's true, and, and we won't um, um, uh, be condemned for, for failing to keep the law of God because we are in Christ if we are true believers. But what James is saying here is that we should live as those who have no excuse not to keep the law of God. And then James ends this discussion in verse 13. He says, uh, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And we're reminded, uh, this reminds me at least, of the principle that uh, Christ taught in Matthew, and specifically in, in chapter 6 and verse 15, where he said, If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will, you fa will your Father forgive your trespasses. So it's a clear biblical principle that if we are to expect mercy from God, 
that we must show mercy to our neighbors as well. And doesn't that, doesn't that make sense? If, if we have received so much forgiveness from God, how much more are we to show uh, grace and compassion to our neighbors? Especially those who, who have done nothing to us, who, who simply exist in a, in a lower financial condition, who appear to us to be poor and, and, and filthy, but, but they have done nothing to us. We, we should be kind to them because of how much grace we have received. Because mercy triumphs over judgment, as James says. This is a very serious matter. If, if, if the Bible says that you cannot expect to receive mercy unless you show mercy, we should certainly pay attention to that. So we should love our neighbors. We should not show partiality. So we've seen that, that showing partiality is, is defined as passing quick judgment uh, on somebody based on their appearance rather than their heart as reflected through their deeds and, and their actions. We have seen that, that James, in, in this second chapter, has given us uh, four reasons not to show partiality. Uh, first, because God forbids partiality specifically, because God does not show partiality himself, because partiality is clearly foolishness, and because partiality is a breach of God's law, specifically of the commandment to love our neighbor. And so what are we to do based on this information? What's the call to action? What's the application? Well, First of all, like I mentioned, we are to remember that, that there are situations in which uh, we are called to show honor. We, we are specifically called to honor those who are in authority over us. And so we should not use this passage as an excuse to, to, to say that, that we will not obey the authorities, we will not do this, we will not do that. We, we are to, to show honor to those uh, to whom honor is due. Remember Romans 13, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. But, but we are to remember to be discerning that, and that somebody who is who's wealthy alone with, with no sort of uh, position of authority over us, we have no right to treat them better than somebody who is poor. Second, we are to remember that, that God's example throughout redemptive history is not to show partiality. That God often chooses the, the least likely, is the term that I like to use, the least likely to, to accomplish great plans in redemptive history. You remember the examples of, of Abraham and David, and even the examples of, of the apostles themselves, many of whom were, were poor fishermen, yet they were used to spread the gospel to all the nations. And third, and this is something I didn't really talk about tonight, but, but uh, we have to remember Christ's example. We remember that Christ did not show partiality. He, he dined with, with Pharisees and with publicans alike. He, he spread the gospel to, to all men. He, in his earthly ministry, uh, humbled himself and, and spent time with, with the poorest and, and with the richest and with everybody. And so we are obviously to model ourselves after Christ's example. And so if Christ did not show partiality, we should not either. Fourth, we are to remember that, that partiality is a serious matter of loving our neighbor. If we show preference to the rich and we, and we show dishonor unto the poor, we are not loving our neighbor. And as James says, this, this is a breach of God's entire law. And, and it really is important. If, if God gave us, uh, Christ gave us the two greatest commandments, that to love uh, the Lord our God with all our heart and to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we fail in the second one of those, those two greatest commandments, that, that's a serious business. So we need to make sure that we're, we're treating men uh, with respect despite their, their poor financial condition. And last, we should take all this information and it should help to motivate us, abstain from vain partiality, but to judge righteous judgment. James' final, manner is that, that we are, uh, James final word on this matter is that we are to behave as those who will be judged by the perfect law of liberty. That we behave as those who, who will have no excuse in the day of judgment to show partiality. We need to, to keep this, this judgment in mind, to keep the fact that, that we have no excuse to sin in mind in every facet of our lives, but of course tonight, specifically in our dealing with other people, specifically in God's command to, to love our neighbors. And I'll leave you with this thought. If showing partiality is so despicable to God, if it is so foreign to how he works, if it is so foolish and hateful to our neighbors, and if it is such a breach of God's law, I think that we should all try to refrain from it, that we should treat all men with, with respect and, and with love, not, not to show partiality to those who, who appear to be better, who, who have social status or wealth. I call all of us to, to be more diligent in this Christian duty this week. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for bringing us all here this evening. I thank you for this message, Lord. I thank you for this passage, passage in James, Lord, and its relevance in our lives. I pray that you would help us, Lord, and that we would not judge our neighbors based on foolish things like clothes, what they're wearing, what their social status is, what kind of car they drive, what their bank account looks like. 
but that we would judge righteous judgment, that we would love all men, show respect and honor to all men, that we would honor those in authority to us, but that we would not respect uh, the poor any less than we respect the rich. Because we know this is a matter of loving our neighbor. We want to keep the commandments of God. So I pray that you give us the diligence and the strength to do this. I pray that you keep us all safe as we leave here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Respond to that preaching of God's word with, uh, O oh love, thou will not let me go. of God and work out your own salvation in fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure and that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore.